Good morning. Uh, it's good to see you once again. Uh, God has certainly been good and faithful. He brought us rain here in Arizona. It's been quite a while since we've had any rain, so that was a huge blessing this week. I pray the Lord is blessing you wherever he finds you and has you today. Our desire this morning is truly to look forward, to look forward that, to all that God has promised us. We're going to be wrapping up the book of 2 Peter today in 2 Peter chapter 3. And you know, remember back, uh, Peter spoke often in his first letter, in 1 Peter, of the hope that we have in Jesus' return. And he devotes the majority of the conclusion of this second letter to the hope that we have in our Lord's second coming. Remember these these believers that Peter was, was first writing to were, were facing growing, serious persecutions. It would not be long before becoming a Christian in Rome would also come with an almost guaranteed death sentence during the days of the Emperor Nero. And it is in this environment that Peter calls us to turn our attention to the one hope that truly supersedes even the scariest, and harshest things this world can throw at us. So let's read here together 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort, as they do the other scriptures, to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard, so that you may not be carried away by the air of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. Let's thank God for his word. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth. We thank you, Lord, that you are always faithful to your word, that you will indeed keep your promises to us. God, uh, we confess that we don't really have a great perspective of time, 
Uh, great perspective of reality that we often have tunnel vision on ourselves and we miss who you are and what you are doing all around us. Remind us today of what you have promised us. Grant us the faith, humility, and courage to truly look forward, to look forward to your return, and to live for your glory. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. So Peter begins here by reminding us that he wrote both of these letters to stimulate us to wholesome thinking, he says. Wholesome meaning sincere, or uncontaminated, or unmixed. Meaning Peter's hope and prayer is that the way we think, the way we process our experiences, the, the way we make our decisions, and the way in which we approach our faith should be genuinely focused, driven, and based on the true hope of the gospel, and not distracted or diverted by the deceptions of this world or the lies of a false teacher. We cannot afford to allow our thinking to become contaminated or our faith distorted by things that simply aren't true or are just not worth living for. You know, we have been given too incredible a grace, hope, and life to squander it away on temporary concerns. We have been called, equipped, and destined for eternal life. Why now would we allow the alarms and anxieties of this world to keep us from looking forward to seeing Jesus? Peter has emphasized again and again in this letter the, the importance of us remembering what God has promised us, remembering the scriptures and all that God has shown us about himself, his salvation, his judgment, and his eternal purposes. You know, just because the world scoffs at the hope we have in Christ, mocking his word and slandering his name, doesn't mean Christ has changed his promises one bit. There always has been and there always will continue to be scoffers of Jesus Christ. Right up until the moment that every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, people naturally get tunnel vision. We see only what is right in front of us, and we live only for that which we can feel right now. The slogan, live in the moment, is truly only as valuable as you perceive your present momentary circumstances to be. The reality is that if you want to truly understand this present moment that Christ has you in, then you need to remember the faithfulness of Christ demonstrated in the past and the hope of Christ that you have in the future. But recognize that this world has long had a tendency to deliberately forget or attempt to erase the past in favor of forming their own narrative for the future. And this is exactly what Peter points out here in verse 5. The world deliberately forgets what God has done. They choose to ignore the evidence right in front of them of, of God's creation, of the great flood, and of God's moral righteousness and justice. As such, they, they deny that God will once again come to judge the earth just as he promised through fire, rightfully destroying that which he has made. You know, the world falsely concludes that since it hasn't happened yet, that that means it won't happen which is uh, like a thief or a crook who assumes that since he has gotten away with his crimes up to this point, that surely he will never ever be caught. But such an arrogant mindset misrepresents the reality of how time works, how true justice works, and frankly, how God works. You see, if we truly know the Lord, if we truly understand his grace, <laughs> then we know the patient, loving God we serve. The God whom Peter assures us here is patient with everyone. Everyone. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. As such, time, as we experience it and often portray it, is not at all a factor in Almighty God's righteous judgment or gracious redemption. 
just because God hasn't completely fulfilled every single bit of his word just yet doesn't by any means imply that he won't do so in the future. Time is no limitation on him, his grace, or his promises. But instead, the assurances we have in Christ through his past faithfulness to his word and his future promises to us actually becomes the hope that we need right now in our present. You know, no matter how much time seems to have gone by or how challenging our circumstances may seem to be, our hope is in Christ, knowing what he has accomplished in the past and all that he has assured us of in the future. But we need to remember that this world does not understand our hope in Christ, because our hope in Christ is not based in this world, but in eternity. Yet the world and its many false teachers do not live for eternity. But instead, many people are naturally cynical about life and others in general, and they are too preoccupied with themselves and what they assume to be their present needs, ambitions, and pleasures. Thus, it is for all of these reasons that when Jesus does return, that scripture tells us here that his coming will be like the coming of a thief. Jesus will return. The saints will be with him. The Antichrist will be defeated and the world will be destroyed by fire. Yet as all of these things are taking place, no matter which end times chart you prefer to use or how you break those key prophetic events up time-wise, a great many people in this world will remain lost, confused, and clueless as to their significance, unaware of what they have truly missed, even as all of these things transpire right in front of them. And the world is then completely consumed by God's fiery judgment. So hear me, church. Just because the world, though, will be oblivious to the return of Christ and all of its implications, certainly does not mean that we should be. On the contrary, we who truly know Christ should eagerly and actively be fully aware, fully focused, and fully driven by the hope we have in Jesus' return. You see, the ultimate question of this passage is asked in verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? God is going to destroy this world, yet he has promised you another. So how should you live in a world that is not truly your home? A world that in and of itself has no real future for you. Peter is clear and direct in his answer. We ought to live holy and godly lives, meaning lives that belong to Jesus, reflect his character, and honor his word. And all of this while we look forward, look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Meaning our hearts, ambitions, and our minds, eager hope should be only for that day that Jesus returns. To speed its coming is just a way of saying to, to urge on, to encourage, and to support his coming. It's a reminder that the return of Jesus isn't something that we as Christians just sit back and passively wait for, but it is something we desire, something we pray for, something we talk about, something we prepare ourselves for, and frankly seek to prepare others for. We are to long for the day and live for the day when this world is destroyed and God makes all things new. However, here is the issue that often holds back our hearts in this matter. While we certainly want all of the blessings that come with everything being made new in Christ, we are so easily tempted to want to hold on to some of the lesser things of this world. The kind of hope that it'll all be blended together. We want Jesus, but we also wouldn't mind keeping some of the stuff we've acquired here. We deceive ourselves into thinking that somehow these earthly things, which are reserved and destined for fire, Scripture says, are worth holding on to. But Christian, you can't hold on to both. You can't live for two worlds any more than you can serve two masters. One day, 
every penny in your bank account, every object you've ever owned, every accolade you've ever earned or received will be gone. Doesn't matter what your earthly legacy might be in the eyes of others because it won't mean a thing in eternity. All that will matter is that you are home with Jesus. For your relationship with him is the only experience from this world that will, that will truly survive and thrive into the next. You know, it's often been said that the most dangerous man is the man who has nothing to lose. Christian, in Christ, you have nothing in this world to lose. Nothing. For you know that this world is already lost while your salvation is secure. So what is holding you back from living entirely for Jesus? In Christ you have no worldly thing left to lose that isn't already lost. So the question then becomes, what then should we pour our earthly energies and efforts into <laughs> if this earth and all of its energies and efforts will ultimately pass away? Well, we should pour them into the one thing that will truly last forever, our relationship with our Savior and Lord. Christian, if we are actually looking forward to Jesus' return, the destruction of the sinful world, and our new eternal home with him, then we should make every effort to live and walk closely and faithfully with him. Peter emphasizes there in verse 14 that the one enduring thing worthy of our efforts is in essence being right with God, striving to know him more and more each day, always desiring to do what is right and to live daily in the peace that comes from truly being with him and in him. There quite simply just isn't any other investment you can make in this life that will bring any sort of eternal return except for an investment in your walk with Jesus. Remember, we serve a patient God who knows exactly what he is doing. He has been incredibly patient with us, with me, with you. He is patient with us because he desires for us to know him. He is gracious, graciously patient with us and with others for the sake of his salvation. So when the world feels overwhelming, when evil takes its toll and the stress of life seems to settle in and maybe you wonder how much longer all of this will last, remember, remember just how patient God has been with you and thank him for his patience as you pray and look forward to his imminent return. Peter points out here in his conclusion that, you know, these are all points that we find in scripture, points that Paul also made in his own letters to the early churches. Letters like those found right, right here throughout the New Testament. Peter observed that Paul's letters contain some things that are difficult to understand, things that false teachers, teachers then and false teachers now continue to try and twist and distort for their own purposes, deliberately forgetting and ignoring the full counsel of God's word, interpreting the scriptures instead as they see fit. Which on that note, uh, you know, I want to emphasize Peter also makes an important statement here implying that Paul's letters to the churches, to us, contain the same authority as the other scriptures. Meaning Peter understood back in the first century that Paul's letters were indeed already scripture. That they were the word of God. These two apostles, who had very different lives, very different encounters and experiences with Jesus, and Quite often, it seems, we're also ministering to Christians and reaching people in different parts of the world. They both understood that God was speaking through them in these letters. This understanding should give us great confidence in God's word, knowing that God indeed inspired these men to write these letters to encourage the church, to encourage us, and that they recognized the divine inspiration in each other's letters. It is so important, church, that we are intentional to not ignore or distort the Word of God, to remember Scripture, to receive it for what it is, and to hold on to and look forward 
to the fulfillment of its promises. You know, it's important that we seek to remember and honor God's word so that we might not be distracted, so that we might not be looking towards the wrong thing but that we will truly only be looking forward to the thing that really defines us. The hope, the salvation that has set us apart. I mean, it, it does us no good to go throughout life looking forward to something that is never going to happen. To look forward to, to something, to some promise that isn't based on the Word of God, that has no guarantee. But the promises of Christ are guaranteed because of who they come from. Because Christ can and will fulfill his word. He will keep his promise. And when we, Christian, rightly understand the promises of God and do not allow ourselves, our thoughts, and our faith to be distracted or distorted by the things of this world, then we can have great confidence, great peace, and great hope as we continually go through this life looking forward to the return of our Savior. Now, you may already know all of this. I may not have said anything new to you today. Peter implied here at the end of the chapter that the Christians he was writing to already understood and were familiar with all these things uh, that he wrote down here in our passage today. But part of Peter's point to us is that a hope as precious as this cannot be taken for granted. It must be guarded. Not because the true object of our hope can be taken away, but because we can so easily place our hope on the wrong object, forgetting what it is we really have to look forward to and why. So brothers, sisters, guard your hope. Do not let your hope sway to anything less than Jesus Christ and his eternal salvation. Do not allow your hope to be drowned out by voices that will one day be silenced, tears that will one day be wiped away, or ambitions that will one day amount to nothing. Guard your hope in Christ. Grow in His grace by living in it, and grow in your knowledge of Him by living with Him by faith. Don't just say, glory be to God. Live for His glory, both now and and forevermore. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are with us right now, never to leave us nor forsake us. I pray, God, today that we would be especially mindful of all that you have promised us, that no matter what may be going on in our lives personally right now, in our families, in our communities, in our nation and in this world, that we would not allow anything, any set of circumstances, to distort or distract us from the hope that we have in your promises, in the hope of eternity, in the new home that you have prepared a place for us in, the place we truly belong. Help us to set aside and let go of the things of this world, to not hold on to that which is destined for fire and destruction, but to hold on to that which will truly last forever. Help us guard our hope in you and your return this week. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Go in the grace and peace of Christ and keep looking forward.